just a dream, it works. And if you did it, suddenly, politically, you'd be able to close the failing schools. It's, it's almost impossible to close a failing school in a traditional district. Because when you try, everyone in the district, every employee and lots of the parents protest. Because it's a, it's a potential threat to everybody. But we know from New Orleans, from Massachusetts with our charter schools, from Washington, D.C., we know that in a charter system, if you close one school, everybody at that school protests, but no one else does. All the other operators look at it as a market opportunity, because they're going to be able to bid to operate a program in that building. And the politics are entirely different. So now you can actually create a reality that if a school's not producing results for the kids, it goes away, which means every teacher and every staff member is going to realize, you know, this may be inconvenient, but we've got to pull together and do what it takes to raise our test scores, to satisfy our parents, and to prove that we can perform. That, to me, would be a 21st century public education system. That's a new paradigm. That's the, the level of change we have to be willing to think about. So that's education. Finally, health care. This is another graph. This is our personal spending, personal consumption expenditures oh, since 1970. You can see the data. The same red line. It's interesting. We spend more and more of our money on health and less and less on food because of the global marketplace and productivity in agriculture, less and less on clothing because of the global marketplace, and less and less, we save less and less of our money, which is a problem. So what do we do? I, with my colleagues, brought a group of experts together, and we, we did what we call a design lab on healthcare reform, and then I have continued to study it for the last couple of years. And I know of seven strategies that we need to use. I'm going to talk about three of them. The first is changing personal behavior. The second is replacing fee-for-service payments with global payments. Third, replacing fragmented delivery systems with integrated managed care systems. Fourth, electronic health record systems that are interoperable statewide. Fifth, new policies to encourage rational end-of-life care. We spend a lot of money on the last year of life somewhere around 20, 25 percent probably of our total health care dollar. And a lot of it, the patients don't even want. It's waste. Sixth, we need to deal with malpractice costs. And my, the, the, the proposal I've seen that makes the most sense is to create a, a separate system of courts to deal with malpractice on the workers' compensation model. And finally, we need antitrust policies because I don't know if this has happened in Oregon, but in a lot of states, the hospitals, when they got squeezed in the 90s, they began to combine. And now we have these huge cartels, and they can dictate prices. Um, and it, that's a problem. So let's talk about the first three. We've talked about personal behavior. In this country, we've attacked smoking somewhat successfully since the 1960s. We need to do the same thing now with diet and exercise. Americans are eating themselves to death. The new epidemic is obesity. And obesity leads to diabetes and heart disease. Now, it's interesting. Smoking kills people quickly, typically in their 60s. They get lung cancer, they die rapidly. Oh, diabetes and heart disease, people stay alive but consume enormous amounts of health care for decades. It's very, very expensive. We've got to get a handle on it. We need our leaders to lead a public crusade to change behavior. We need sin taxes on junk food. You know, everybody who gets diabetes and ends up on Medicaid, or even on private insurance, you're paying for them. You're all paying for them, right? So why not impose some of those costs on them? We have a fiscal crisis, by the way, so we need a little more revenue. So we should put sin taxes on things that are bad and create costs for other people. And finally, we need positive incentives, like in your health insurance, if you maintain a healthy body weight and you join a gym and you exercise, you get a discount, those sorts of things. Second, fee-for-service. 
This is uh, probably the biggest driver of inflation, I believe, in healthcare. The way we pay for it. Now, sometimes we make capitated payments. Fee-for-service is the majority of how we pay for healthcare, but not entirely. But when we do it, when we pay for procedures, we're rewarding the wrong thing. We're rewarding people who do more procedures. And in fact, if a hospital makes an error and you have to be readmitted, they make more money because they do more procedures. What's even worse, there are medical practices in this country that have gotten creative about keeping people healthy, healthy without so many procedures, and they start to go broke. And the partners get together and say, you know, we can't afford to practice this way. Our incomes are going down. We've got to go back, to, we've got to do more procedures. We are the best in the world at medical procedures. Rich people come from all over the world to America to have medical procedures. We invent the majority of new medical procedures. And according to the World Health Organization, we're 37th at health. 37th in the world, the health of our population. So we've got to shift that. We've got to buy health, not procedures. Third thing I want to mention is the fragmentation problem. We have, as you know, lots of medical practices, lots of hospitals, et cetera, et cetera, and lots of insurance companies and lots of billing going back and forth. Anybody here in the medical business? Yeah, you know about billing? I was married for a long time to a doctor, and uh, it was incredible how much they had to spend on billing. So the studies tell you that 25 to 30 percent of the money in healthcare goes to administrative administrative overhead of one kind or another. For example, there was a study showing that one in five lab tests is done, it's a repeat. You're at the hospital, the lab test was done at your doctor's office, the hospital doesn't have the results so they have to repeat it. And one in seven hospital admissions are for the same reason, because they don't have the tests that have been done elsewhere. That's inefficiency. That's because our system doesn't coordinate often. And quality suffers when people don't coordinate. How many of you have elderly parents and you've tried to manage their health care? And they take like six or seven medications and they have five different doctors and the doctors don't coordinate and the medications interact and it can be a nightmare. So we need to attack that problem. So let's talk about the solutions. We can shift in the marketplace from fee-for-service reimbursement to what's called global payments by getting the health plans, Medicaid, Medicare, and all the private health insurance plans to pay their doctors and hospitals, if they're not using a, a, a salary for the doctors, to pay a global payment for a full cycle of care for a medical condition. Have a knee replacement, X dollars. All the care, if there are complications too bad, that all you get is X dollars and you take care of the person. Because then the competition will be about the right things. Right now, medical pr providers are competing over how many procedures they can do. And we want them to compete over how efficiently they can keep people healthy or get people back to health. That's a different form of competition and that's what we want. We also want integrated delivery systems. Regions that have integrated, a lot of integrated systems have costs up to a third lower than other regions, according to the research. And it's because an integrated system, like a Kaiser, you know, they can look at the full spectrum of care from the moment somebody walks in the door to hospital, intense, the intensive care unit, and they can decide the most cost-effective place and way to treat each person. They also have the resources to invest in IT, to invest in evidence-based care, you know, to do all kinds of the right things to create productivity. So how do we get there? How do we get global payments and integrated delivery systems? Well, you already in Oregon probably purchase, the state probably purchases, if you're average, 21% of the healthcare in this marketplace. You're probably above average because you're a little poorer, as you heard earlier, than average. So let's say you purchase 22 or 23 percent of the health care in Oregon. Once the federal law 
health reform law kicks in in, uh, in 2014, you'll add another, on average, 14% to that. You'll, so the average state will be purchasing 35% of the health care, or involved in purchasing 35% of the health care in the market. So why not aggregate that purchasing power and use it to drive the market? You're going to have a new exchange under the federal bill, either one or two for individuals and businesses. You already have an exchange, if you will, for state employees and retirees, and you could add as many, you ought to add as many local government and education people to that as you're politically able. And you could operate most of Medicaid as an exchange. Now, an exchange is simply Think of the stock exchange. It's a place you go to buy things. So it's a structured market through which individuals and businesses can purchase health plans, get information about prices, about quality, and choose an appropriate plan. People access it either over the web or if they're not using the web through telephone calls and paper stuff mailed to them. States already run them for their employees and retirees. Federal government runs one for federal employees and retirees. In Massachusetts, we created one for people without insurance, and that was the model for the, the federal bill. So these things exist. Now, the key is how do you drive the market? How do you create the right kind of competition? And here, fortunately, Wisconsin has figured it out for us. In 2003, a guy named David Reamer was a budget director in Wisconsin, and he was a devotee of Alan Entoven at Stanford Business School, who's been arguing this strategy for decades. They decided, OK, for our state retirees and employees, we're going to define, we always define the basic benefit package. And then we ask the health plans to submit bids, how much it will cost. What we're going to start doing is ranking the bids into three tiers. Tier one is low cost, high quality plans. Tier two is higher cost. Lower quality, tier three is highest cost. And an employee can choose any plan out of any tier, but tier one's going to be cheap for them. Tier two is going to be more expensive. Tier three is going to be even more expensive. So most of them choose a tier one plan, which means all the health plans fight to get into tier one. How do you get into tier one? High quality, low prices. So the health plans start to try to change and become more productive and create higher quality. Now, here's the key. In one county, they have the state capital and the biggest state university. It's Dane County, where Madison is. And in that county, over 20% of the non-Medicaid, non-Medicare market is state employees and retirees. So what happened in that county is it was a big enough chunk that all the health plans wanted a piece of it. Nobody was going to walk away from 20% of the market. So they began to reorganize. They began to make changes. And you know, some medical practices in a hospital created a new health maintenance organization. And another HMO moved in from outside the county. And the, the market began to restructure. And in the next six years, prices, which had been at the statewide average, basically, for state employees, suddenly in that county, they're now 16% below the statewide average. So they've bent the cost curve in the one county. That's the key. They've shown they can do it. And by the way, they plan to use that strategy with their new exchange. You could too. It's the right strategy. The second thing you could do, if you want to, is when you rank health plans, you give bonus points, if you will, for the, the behavior you want. You want them to shift to global payments? Give them bonus points. You want them to deliver integrated managed care? Give them bonus points. You want them to use disease management? Give them bonus points, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, to work, the exchanges have to make sure that quality and outcomes are measured honestly, and that that data is available on the website so we're all making informed decisions when we make our purchases. But that's doable, and I believe that that's the future. Now, there's all kinds of other things we need to do. This is just a list. I don't have time to talk about anything more. But I want to make one last point, which is change on this scale, elected leaders can't lead. Elected leaders can only lead within a paradigm. Shifting paradigms is too risky. 
So this stuff won't happen unless outsiders like you lead it and create the political space that makes it safe for the governor and the legislators to talk about things like charter districts and global payments. This stuff is tough politically. There's resistance, massive resistance. So it only happens on this scale if folks like you lead it. But it is possible. Now, the, the toughest obstacle is probably that you're gonna, your government is going to be cutting, cutting, cutting to balance budgets. And it's really hard to innovate when you're cutting and there's blood on the floor. So I want to show you one strategy that, would, that has worked in other states. We invented this in Iowa with Tom Vilsack in 2003. He, he, his revenues went down five years in a row in Iowa from 2001 through 2006. And in the middle of that, the legislature was getting tired of cuts. They were desperate for savings. And so he took a deal to them. He said, look, let's create a reinvention savings line item, a negative line item in the budget. And we'll spend the winter negotiating about what projects we're going to fund to save that money. So that it ended up being three projects with a target savings of $88.5 million, and 25 million of that reinvested in the change. Because you can't make change without investment. You have to spend money to save money. Just like in business, you have to spend money to make money. So they chose three strategies. Two of them worked and saved the state uh, over $100 million in three years. The third one, the state on a new deal between the state and local governments, we spent a year on. The locals got all excited about it. The state legislature walked up to it and said, nah, we'll just cut their budgets. And, you know, we got a huge black eye. So it doesn't all work, but they still saved a lot of money this way. So you put the savings in the budget and commit to producing them rather than waiting until you've produced them, and that puts the pressure on. Vermont's leaders, led by the legislature, did the same thing last uh, December and January and put it in, in their budget. They had a series of different 11 service redesign challenges with, with savings targets, and they put them in the budget. So it's a, it's a good strategy. So in conclusion, the tools are all out there. They've been written about, they've been documented, my books, other people's books. The tools are all out there. They've all worked somewhere. Everything I've talked about has worked somewhere. It's just a question of pulling them together and having the political will to use them. If you do, then Oregon, the quality of life in Oregon and the standard of living of your citizens will increase because government has an enormous impact on all of that. If you don't, Oregon will get poorer. And the choice is that simple. I'm a big fan of traditional Native American philosophy, if you will. And I want to leave you with one very wise saying. It's an old Lakota saying. When you're riding a dead horse, the best strategy is to dismount. <laughs> In the 21st century, Bureaucracy is a dead horse, and it's time to move on. Thank you very much.